800 years ago this month, in 1215, the Fourth Lateran Council called by Pope Innocent III gathered in Rome. It brought together 412 bishops, 71 archbishops and patriarchs, 800 abbots, and thousands of lesser clergy and lay people. This was the largest council that had ever met at the time. And yet, most of us have never really heard of it, right? So well, it's probably not actually true, however, that most of us haven't really heard of it. If you read much theology, you probably, will, you probably will have come across Lateran IV, normally with some passing reference to how it was at Lateran IV that the first formal mention of transubstantiation was made. Or maybe that it was at Lateran IV that it was mandated that everyone confess his sins at least once a year and receive the Eucharist at Easter. Or maybe if you are into the really difficult things, that Lateran IV clarified the idea of analogy by declaring that between creator and creature there can be noted no similarity so great that a greater dissimilarity cannot be seen between them. It's a declaration that we'll see later that gets at the very heart of medieval Catholicism. It was Lateran IV that promulgated the most extensive creed since Nicaea, a creed that placed the Eucharist and the sacramental system at the very center of Christian doctrine. You may have also come across Lateran IV if you are a student of canon law, for it was Lateran, Lateran IV that established many of the procedures for canonical cases that would be developed and per, uh, up through modern times. If you're interested in pastoral care, you will have uh, come across the council in relation to preaching, to the establishment of seminaries, to the responsibility of the parish priest to care for his flock. And if you're interested in the great mendicant orders, the Franciscans and the Dominicans, you would definitely have come across Lateran IV as the launching pad for their great initiatives. And if you're interested in the more controversial sides of Christendom, you will have come across Lateran IV certainly in the sense that it promulgated the procedures that would eventually develop into the Inquisition within just uh, a few years after the council was held. And it formalized the rationale for the Albigensian Crusade, which is the great crusade into southern France against the heretics, the Albigensian heretics. Lateran IV also called for offensive against the Muslims in the Holy Land. And Lateran IV mandated that both Jews and Muslims wear special clothes so that Christians could easily recognize them. So Lateran IV did a great deal. And we come across Lateran IV a lot, although normally in footnotes, normally buried somewhere in the footnote. So why, is the question. Why do most of us know so little about it if it's so important? Uh, why is it that we might know this or that little thing about it? but do not understand what the council was, what, what it was really about, why it was called, what animated it. You know, if you consider this, if you consider that a fairly well-read Catholic could tell you something about Nicaea, right? something about the Council of Nicaea. We know that it marked the transition from the church persecuted to the imperial church. We know about Constantine and all that drama, right? Um, Council of Trent, similar. You know, it's something about the Reformation. It's something about defending Catholic doctrine against the Protestant attack and launching the Counter-Reformation. Similarly with Vatican II, I mean, we breathe Vatican II. We're living Vatican II. We could all say something about it. Why is it that we can talk about those councils, most of us? And that's because what I would say is that they're epochal. They show us something about who the church is in a certain epoch, right, in a certain time and place. And they mark the church's encounter with the world at that time and place, normally with some sort of a shift in worldview. Um, so we pay attention to these councils, and not so much to, to more minor councils. I mean, who can tell us much about the Council of Vienne of 1312, for example? Why? It's because unlike these minor councils, the apocal councils dealt not with the details of the church in the world, but with the fundamentals, with the very foundations on which the church is built. These councils show us worldviews. Lateran IV is such a council. It is the Great Council of Christendom. That's what they called it, the Great Council. The Middle Ages at its, at its very peak, and yet it remains a blind spot. Why? And the reason, I think, is because the worldview that it shows is one that we have forgotten how to understand. Because we cannot see the whole, we tend to see Lateran IV as a disconnected list of enactments and firsts. It did this and it did that. But rarely it was this. Rarely it was about this or that. So it is, this is so because the medieval world remains foreign to us. Modernity, in its so-called enlightenment, discarded centuries of history, uh, hundreds of years of Christian life, thought, and worship. 
And we, we, we live with minds that are profoundly shaped by the Enlightenment, and we have a really hard time getting back to that medieval worldview, that worldview of Christendom. And that worldview was profoundly different than the Enlightenment view, very different. And it is this Christendom that is enshrined in the decrees and canons of Lateran IV. And it's really the, it's the notion of a society of the baptized that encompasses all their lives and which was rooted ultimately in a scriptural, liturgical, and sacramental worldview. If at Nicaea we see, the, we see the church being formed, and at Trent we see the church under assault, at Lateran IV, or at Vatican II, we see the church evangelizing, I would say. At Lateran IV, we see the church governing the church sanctifying and defending a baptized people and really attempting to build a society of faith, hope, and charity and believing it could do so. Lateran IV shows us Christianity at its most optimistic. Lateran IV is the counsel of a world that understood itself through the scripture and the liturgy, history, politics, economics, cosmology, all such structures ultimately were built on a liturgical foundation. This world was also the world of scripture, Scripture was understood liturgically, and the liturgy was li the living out of Scripture. They were inseparable, and they provided the very framework through which reality was understood and through which action was taken. So this is the vision that I'm going to try to share with you this evening and then over the course of the next two weeks. And understanding this vision, I think, is very important. Now, I think, more than ever. Because the West is at a turning point right now. Everywhere, the systems of modernity are breaking down. Postmodernism, whatever that may mean, is becoming dominant. And postmodernism, perhaps ironically, I think, provides an opportunity because all postmodernism really does is break down modernity according to its own rules. It doesn't have the resources to replace it with another worldview. It just it doesn't. It lacks the vision. It lacks the artistry. It has no creative imagination. It can't imagine something new. It's very, very good at deconstructing, but it's very, very bad at building. And I would like to propose that the worldview of the Fourth Lateran Council can help us imagine a new world that might be built on the ruins of modernity. And I know that may be a little bit of an extreme statement, but I think it's true. Not that we could or should attempt to rebuild the medieval world, but rather, by studying it, we can gain materials to help build a new one, a world in which liturgy, scripture, and sacrament are not simply at the center of our lives as religious people in the midst of a secular world, but rather in which liturgy, scripture, and sacrament are at the center of all social reality because they're at the center of the very cosmos. So let's get to the council here. Lateran IV was different from the first three Lateran councils from its very inception. Laterans I, II, and III had all been called to settle particular crises in the church normally focused on the papacy's relations with the German emperors. Lateran IV was different. Pope Innocent III conceived of the council from the very beginning as something much larger. This was not an emergency gathering. It was to plan a great reform and not little ones. So to this end, Innocent sent out letters to the bishops in 1213, two years before the council, so they couldn't make the excuse that they'd already made plans. Then he sent legates, who we might, who might think of as sort of papal ambassadors, to the provinces of the church to gather information concerning what needed reform, what needed to be addressed. It was not that Innocent, though, was having a hard time coming up with things. He'd reigned for a long time already and had dealt with many, many issues. And we can see, actually, in the summons that he sends out to the bishops, he wrote, he wrote for example, this is a quote, it will be a council in which, in order to uproot vices and implant virtues, to correct abuses and reform morals, to eliminate heresies and strengthen faith, to allay differences and establish peace, to check persecutions and cherish liberty, to persuade Christian princes and peoples to grant succor and support for the Holy Land from both clergy and laymen, and for other reasons, which it would be too tedious to enumerate here, whatever, with the council's approval, shall have seemed expedient for the honor and glory of the divine name, for the healing and salvation of our souls, and for the good and benefit of the Christian people, may be wisely established as decrees of inviolable force affecting prelates and clergy, regular and secular. So that's all, right? Just a little bit of business. You know, Pope Innocent gets a lot of criticism, but no one claims he wasn't ambitious. Um, but Pope Innocent did have a focus. It wasn't just this fix everything. There was two major issues, where the, and they were the recovery of Jerusalem, which had fallen to the famous Muslim Saladin in 1187, 
and the reform of the universal church. And these two initiatives were not divorced from each other in, in Innocent's mind. They were very much wrapped up with each other within the worldview inhabited by both the Pope and the Christian people that he was speaking to. And to understand how, how they're wrapped up together, we have to understand the manner in which the society approached the Bible. And I realize that that might seem like a strange assertion, that how they read the Bible was directly related to how they went to war or how they built in, uh, in ecclesiastical institutions, but it really was the case. The world, we might say, was viewed through a biblical lens. And at the same time, the Bible was read as immediately relevant to the world. To get at this, I want to turn to the sermon that Innocent III preached at the opening mass of the council. The Pope preached a sermon on the text of Luke 22:15, where at the Last Supper, Christ says to the apostles, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Innocent places himself in the position of Christ. It is he, the Pope, who has earnestly desired to eat this Passover with the assembled council fathers. But this is not a generic Passover. To Innocent, Innocent had something much, much grander in mind. So the sermon continues that just as King Josiah, in the 18th year of his reign, restored the temple and celebrated the Passover, so Innocent, in the 18th year of his reign, which it was, would restore the temple of the Lord, which was the church. And the Passover, which now Innocent identifies as the council and its work, would be celebrated. Now, Josiah, we know from 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles, was the last of the good kings of the line of David. Josiah attempted to restore the right worship of God in the temple of Jerusalem and to enforce the law of Moses. When he had completed massive reforms, eliminating idols and re reinstituting the Mosaic law, he held a massive Passover celebration. As Second Chronicles tells us, no Passover like it had been kept in Israel since the days of Samuel the prophet. None of the kings of Israel had kept such a Passover as, as was kept by Josiah. So this Passover was an attempt at renewing the covenant between Israel and the Lord. Innocent, then, was placing himself as Josiah, and the church was the temple, the very dwelling place of God and the place of his worship, the heart of Israel and its covenant with God. The Passover, which was the council and its work of reform, would be the context for a renewing of the covenant with God. It is important, then, that we do not see this council simply as some sort of governmental reform or some sort of sorting out of intellectual uh, doctrines. To Innocent, the meaning of the council was found in the Old Testament read through the New Testament. Innocent, the new Josiah, would lead the new Israel to the proper observance of the new covenant through the new Passover, which was, of course, the very Paschal mystery of Christ. Now, all this might seem a little abstract, and perhaps it might, you, might, you might be tempted to think it a bit of rhetorical exuberance, but it's not so. This profoundly scriptural understanding of what was going on becomes pronounced and specified as Innocent's sermon progresses. Innocent asserts that this Passover that they must celebrate must be understood in three senses. The physical, the liberation of Jerusalem, the crusade, the spiritual, the reform of the church, and the eternal salvation. These are the three senses of scripture we'll get to in a minute. He then proceeds to expound upon how each of these um, is bound up with the paschal sacrifice of Christ itself. The sermon culminates in Innocent's treatment of salvation, the eternal Passover. It was this Passover, above all, Innocent says, that he desires to eat with the fathers. And the meal be could be understood either spiritually or corporally. Both meanings come together in the Eucharist. Of the Eucharist, it is said, he that eats me shall live because of me. Of eternal glory it is read, blessed is he who will eat the bread of the kingdom of God. That's how he ends the sermon. So if we were to diagram the sermon, it would be something like this. Josiah reforms the temple, right, and celebrates the Passover in order to renew the old covenant. Innocent reforms the church, which happens through the Passover, which is the process of historical to spiritual to anagogical, so, and I'll get to these in a minute, culminating in Christ himself in the sacrament, and so salvation in order to renew the new covenant. And so we see in the sermon that innocent begins with the words of Christ, the Last Supper, and he ends it with the Eucharist, the perpetuation of the eternal sacrifice temporally, while in between comes the mission of the church in history. The mission of the church was read from within the same system of meaning as the scripture. But more than that, 
It was integral to that meaning. Innocent was telling us what the story of Josiah meant as much as he was telling us what the church was. The meaning of scripture was alive in and through the history-bound life of the church. We see this in his treatment of Passover. He pulls the concept out of the Old Testament, reads it through the books of the New Testament, and then into the New Testament itself, which is nothing less than the life of the church. This is not a series of metaphors. It's important that we understand that. He's telling us what the Passover itself means. And it is a meaning that is always immediately relevant because its meaning is ultimately Christ himself. He does this through the senses of Scripture, and it is only by understanding the four senses um, as it was understood at the turn of the 13th century, that we can understand the worldview in which Innocent lived and within which his sermon and the council can be made sense of. What do I do with my marker? Uh Uh-oh. There it is. Okay, so most of you, I'm just going to step away. I think I can talk loud enough, are probably familiar with the four senses of Scripture. They're normally listed as... Uh, I'll start over here. Oh, no, I won't. They're normally listed as the literal. And then you have the allegorical, the tropological, sometimes called the moral sense, and then the anagogical. Right? Okay, so, they're no, and they're normally defined, so these are the spiritual senses. This is the literal sense, is the literal sense, and then these are the spiritual senses. Together they form the four senses. And they're normally defined um, something like this. The literal sense is the simple meaning of the words. The temple is the building in Jerusalem, the center of the Israelite cult. All right? The allegorical sense shows how the literal points to Christ. The temple is Christ himself the dwelling place of God, as we see when Christ said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The tropological sense shows us how to live, how it applies to us. The temple is our bodies and souls that we must make dwelling places for the Lord. We might call this the moral of the story. That's what it's sometimes called. The anagogical sense shows us how it applies to the last things. In heaven there will be no temple because, as Revelation tells us, the Lord God and the Lamb will be the temple. Within this scheme, it seems that the different senses are sort of lined up next to each other. They are different ways of reading the same text, different possible interpretations or glosses. This is the way it's normally presented. But I don't think this way of understanding it really gets at, it doesn't really capture how they understood it at the time of Lateran IV. Rather than being understood as parallel senses or readings of a given passage that somehow existed side by side, the the four senses were understood as being dynamically related to each other and to the totality of the spiritual life and to the whole story of salvation history, and that at each step there was an essential prerequisite condition of the person approaching the text. The relationships between the senses was not one of static dialectic, but of ascent, an ascent that included the reader. So within this ascent, with each sense, the higher sense is anticipated, and the lesser senses are fulfilled. So in order to understand this, I'm going to go through the senses one by one. But before I do, I want you to see the dynamic I'm going to be talking about is like, kind of like this. All right? <clears throat> so the literal sense was more, was more often called the historical sense in the period. And it was the realities, the things that the scripture related. It was not simply the meaning of the words. It was rather the realities that the words told us about. The literal meaning meaning of the temple was not the word temple, but the actual thing, the temple. The word told us that it had really been there. The scripture was the inspired witness to the actions of God in history. Seeing these actions in history simply for what they were is the historical sense of scripture, or it was. The historical sense was what happened in the exterior world of things and time. And so the historical sense was open to anyone. The historical sense was a sense that was intelligible in the exterior world. And anyone who lived in that world could grasp it. But if one wanted to understand history, if one wanted to understand what really happened, or, had to, or, or one had to begin to transition into the allegorical sense. 
And I think we can understand this, because if you ask something, if you ask the question, what really did happen, or what does the history mean, what you are really asking is how do the events of history fit into something bigger than themselves? Right? How do they fit into what we might think of as sort of the deep structure of history? That's how we get their meaning. This is to try to situate the events within the context of what is ultimately real. And this is Christ. Christ is the event. He's the event that all the other events of history are oriented to. Because Christ is God himself entering history definitively, all earlier revelations must be contained within the fullness of God's total self-revelation in Jesus Christ himself. This is to say that all of salvation history has its meaning in and through the incarnation of Jesus Christ, who is understood as the telos, the goal and end. This understanding is the basis for the allegorical sense. God speaks through his actions in a way similar to how he speaks through words. History is, the, is his word, and of course Christ is his definitive utterance. We can see then that the allegorical sense, the allegorical reading of an event, does not destroy the historicity of the event. Rather, it completely presupposes it and confirms it. History, or the literal sense, is understood through the allegorical sense, not destroyed by it, through Christ, right, who is its meaning. Now, in this definition, what we see is that the allegorical sense is both dependent on and constructive of the virtue of faith. It begins from a position of faith in Christ. And as you develop a deeper faith, a deeper understanding of Christ, your allegorical understanding of salvation history deepens because you know Christ better. You recognize him easier and more completely. This shows the great difference between the historical and the allegorical senses. The allegorical sense emerges from a position of grace, from faith. This is why it is the first spiritual sense and not just another layer to the literal. Nevertheless, we might say that the allegorical sense, which as we have seen includes completely the historical sense, constituted the objective content of faith. It's my, what we might call the data of revelation. But it is a content that is only accessible to the eyes of faith. And here we see the movement to the tropological. So the tropological sense comes from the interiorization of the objective, which is the allegorical understanding of history. It is the content of the faith brought to fulfillment in the soul of the Christian. Tropology is about the incorporation of the soul into the mystery that is Christ. The Temple of Solomon, for example, is allegorically Christ, but it is also tropologically our heart. Christ's dwelling in our temple, which is our heart, is the interiorization of the gospel, which includes completely the Old Testament through allegory. So remember, allegory is all about reading all revelation through Christ about reading Christ as the actual content of all scripture. The allegorical reading therefore reveals the tropological because the tropological is nothing other than the interiorization of the gospel and the gospel must be known. Christ must be known before one can be conformed to him. But at the same time, Christ cannot be totally known except by conforming oneself to him. So the allegorical is both prerequisite to the tropological but it is also perfected in the tropological. If allegory therefore concerns Christ as the head, tropology is about building his body, the body of the faithful. It is about conforming the Christian into Christ's body, which is to say it's about the church. It's ecclesial. It was a commonplace in the period to point out that whatever can be said about Christ could be said about the church and the individual soul. So let me give an example from St. Augustine on the temple water first. St. Augustine writes, together we are his, that is Christ's temple, and individually we are his temples, because he deigns to swell in the union of all and in every individual. He is not larger in the union than, than in the individual, for his is not increased through a large mass of people, nor decreased by being separated in individuals. When lifted up to him, our heart is his altar. To him, by his priests, the only begotten one, we are reconciled. To him, we offer bleeding sacrifices when we struggle for his truth, even to the point of martyrdom. To him, we burn the sweetest incense when in his sight we are afire with pious and holy love. To him, we dedicate and give in return his own gifts within us and our very selves. To him, in solemn feasts and established holy days, we affirm and consecrate 
the memory of his benefits, so that ungrateful oblivion might not steal that memory through the passing of time. To him we sacrifice the offering of humility and praise, burning with the fire of charity in the altar of our heart. And he goes on to assert that the great good which is becoming the temple of Christ is a good that we must be led to by those who love us, and we must lead those whom we love to it. And so we see, we can see that if allegory is the sense particularly connected with faith, tropology is that connected to charity. It is through both faith and charity that we are made Christ's body. And so the tropological statement that we are the temple includes within it the allegorical understanding of the temple as Christ himself. And so St. Bernard of Clairvaux asserts that the entire gospel can be interpreted according to tropology so that what has proceeded in the head may consequently also believe to come about morally in its body. But even this idea fails to capture something of what they meant by the moral sense. Tropology was the first subjective sense. It was a sense that existed in the person, and it became a sense of scripture, not when a certain commentary is written in the margin, temple equals soul, or something like that. Rather, it was fully itself when it was lived, and it was expressed in preaching, in both deeds and words. Through such preaching, the sacrament, or the, uh, the scripture, remained alive. That's the tropological sense proper, is the preaching. In the tropological, then, what happened historically happens again in the life of the believer spiritually. As the medievals would say, all days become today. The mysteries of the historical and allegorical are not simply represented in the life of the church, however. They are interiorized and so accomplished or fulfilled. We might even say they're incarnated. As Henri de Labac summed up the high medieval understanding, it's kind of a long quote from him, each day deep within ourselves, Israel departs from Egypt. Each day it is nourished with manna. Each day it fulfills the law. Each day it must engage in combat. Each day the promises that had been made to this people under a bodily form are realized spiritually in us. Each day also the Gentiles give themselves over to the worship of their idols. Each day the Israelites themselves are unfaithful. Each day in this interior region the land devours the impious. Each day again there is the Lord's visit. Each day he approaches Jerusalem. Each day is his advent. So we see that all of salvation history prefigured Christ, who became totus Christus, the total Christ in the life of the church. Therefore, nothing of history or allegory, the objective faith, we might say, are lost in the move of the tropology. Rather, they are fulfilled in the life of faith and charity of the church. We will have, and we will have a great deal, I'll have a great deal more to say about this in the next lecture about the reform initiatives of Lateran IV. So finally, we come to anagogy. The anagogical sense is the fulfillment of all scripture. As one approaches perfection, allegory becomes increasingly no longer distinct from tropology because the faith is interiorized in the life of charity. So this unity of faith and charity in the believer is the unity of the objective and the subjective. It's the unity of the intellect and the will. It's the unity of Christ and the soul. And this unity is the ultimate meaning of the, trop of the anagogical sense. Uh, of scripture, the anagogical sense. And it, really what it is is contemplation. So it's the goal to which scripture tends, and it is also the full understanding of scripture. At its perfection, it is heaven itself, communion with God. It's also the second subjective sense, and as so, it is hard to distinguish anagogy from tropology in any way that is too concrete. Where charity is realized and faith is interiorized, anagogy begins to appear. So that, and as that, it begins to appear as that perfection that you're striving after. It's hazy, right? It's, it's, not, it's not clear because it's only fully realized um, beyond this world, but it's there. So as Rupert of Deutz said, to comprehend the mysteries of scripture in mind and in life is all ready to reign in the kingdom of God. So the anagogical sense is never perfectly realized in this life. It begins to appear, one ascends deeper into it, and yet its full realization remains always just out of reach. Where allegory is faith and tropology is charity, we can see that anagogy is hope, hope and salvation. It's what drives the whole ascent. So the reading of scripture was therefore always eschatological. The anagogical sense of scripture is ultimately the end of scripture as such. In contemplation, one faces the, world, the word directly without need of mediation through the letter. 
The letter history is finally and completely al allegorized and moralized and fully interiorized so that we might say that in his communion with Christ, the contemplative is the living scripture. And this is not because the scripture, the books have some sort of flaw or that they're being superseded. Um, it's that they're being completely fulfilled. But this again happens only in heaven, right? And it's completion. But that's the thing to which it tends. So what I've hoped to, we've seen here up to this point is that each sense has, has, the, has the next sense as its proper end, but each sense can also, can only become fully itself as it verges into that sense. They cannot and do not stand alone, alone, rather they form a dynamic unity. And this dynamic is one of ascent. We are so used to dialectic, to progress being the result of thesis, antithesis, synthesis, that it is hard at first to envision a progress of unity through ascent to that which is higher, a progress based not on surpassing or making obsolete that which is prior, but in fulfilling it and making it fully what it is. This is a fundamental paradigm difference between ourselves and the Christians of the high Middle Ages. Um, for us, I think conflict is the root of all things. For them, communion and love was the root of all things. So rather than this static scheme here, I think we might draw something more like, more like this to get better at what, how they understood it. More like a pyramid. Oh, no, don't do it. There we go. Where you have history. It's the foundation. And then... The two avenues of ascent are allegory and tropology, but they're very much, they're totally dynamically related to each other, right? Um, the more you understand, the more you see Christ in history, the more you're driven to interiorize it, and the more you interiorize it, the more you're capable of understanding, you know, the more you can see Christ in history better. So they're, they're dynamic in the middle where they're, where they're congruent is anagogy, and this is the drive of ascent towards pure anagogy or, you know, contemplation, heaven. So it's not static at all. I think that's a more, much more accurate description. Although, even this, I think, perhaps, where's my little thing? doesn't capture fully the way they would have understood it. And I think maybe something more like this, and I'll draw it here, my pen holds out. Okay, where you have history, Allegory, tropology, and so the dynamic, of course, is this way, this movement. But what you have is as you move from history into allegory, which is much more dense, say, um, you still you still have there's still history. There's still uh, content from scripture that has not been understood allegorically, that you're not living in allegorically. So there's always work to be done, right? But as you move further then into tropology, you have the same phenomenon where there's still, from a tropological point of view, from the interiorization of the gospel, you're in a position to see allegory better. And so you're pulling what's left of history through allegory into yourself. Um, and, that, and that just becomes more and more dense until finally the sort of singularity, right? Where it all comes together, the full convergence of it all was his anagogy, there's no more history, there's no more allegory, it's all been interiorized. It's anagogy, right? Um, so I think that would be a much, more, a much more accurate way of diagramming what they understood than the sort of static uh, three spiritual senses lined up next to each other. So one of the obvious things that this reading of the four senses of scripture has revealed is the extent to which they were wrapped up in the spiritual life of the believer, and so of the church. The church was not a passive reader of the Bible. 
Rather, the church lived the Bible, which is the revelation of Christ himself, and the Bible's senses corresponded to the church's ability to receive those senses. That is to say, the extent to which it had conformed itself to Christ, and to the extent that it was the body of Christ, therefore. We can say, I think, that the senses emerged out of the Bible only at the point at which the believer was ready to receive them. St. Gregory the Great, for example, explained the two disciples on the road to Emmaus' inability to recognize Christ, not as Christ hiding himself, but rather to their, rather to their being unable because unprepared, thank you, to recognize him. The deficiency was within them. The deficiency was removed, however, as Christ expounded the allegorical content of Scripture, which caused their hearts to burn, which is the converted to the tropological. The breaking of the bread was the final breaking through of the Spirit through the letter, and then they saw him for who he really was, the anagogical. So the process in the senses of Scripture was at the same time progress into faith, charity, and hope. That is to say, the convergence of the intellect in allegory with the will and tropology and the eschatological breaking through of the incarnation, which is anagogy. It is only then that Christ is fully recognized. But the road to Emmaus story actually shows us another component of this dynamic. It shows us its sacramentality. The spiritual senses of scripture are spiritual and not just layers to the literal because they are the products of grace. Faith, charity, and hope are infused theological virtues. The allegorical, tropological, and anagogical are opened up through grace. One is prepared to see them and understand them through grace. And this grace comes primarily through the sacraments, especially the Eucharist. This is not just some sort of mechanical, functional necessity. You need this in order to do this. Rather, the Eucharist and the liturgy of which it is the heart is the summation of this entire process that I've been describing. We might say that the understanding, that understanding the scripture through the four senses is a Eucharistic or a liturgical understanding of scripture. And you just consider the mass to see this. The three stages of the spiritual senses and so the spiritual life are clearly laid out. The scripture is read, especially in the epistles, it's given an allegorical reading. This is the building up of faith. The gospel is proclaimed as the fulfillment of the allegorical reading of history. This gospel truth is then preached by the bishop, the successor of the apostles, which is the tropological. And finally, the Christ event, that is the central event in both history and in the life of the living church, breaks through into the now, through the Eucharist. This is the anagogical. Throughout, the people conform themselves, convert themselves to Christ, and then the Eucharist all comes together. Christ is, as we have seen, the point of convergence for the senses of Scripture, and he is the point of convergence for the different components of the, of the spiritual life. In the Eucharist, both converge. All of Christ in his prefiguration, his life, his teaching, death, and resurrection is, as St. Augustine would say, the sacrament of the interior man, and all of Christian life is a configuration to the mystery of Christ. This is what is present in the Mass. Through the sacrament, which is nothing other than Christ, who is the same word of God expressed in the scriptures. The people are made the body of Christ, united with each other and with the head. This is the anagogical, unity with Christ. It is the end of the whole dynamic of scripture and Christian life. And it is also the source of the whole dynamic, because it is through the sacraments, which is to say, of course, through Christ, that Christ, that the grace of the whole process, the grace that the whole process presupposes, is poured into the life of the church. So what I've attempted to describe here up to this point is not a vision for how to read a book. This is a vision of reality itself. It's a cosmology. And we can see how its central pattern appears again and again in every corner of, the high, of high medieval life and thought. For example, the temple was the building in Jerusalem. It was also the soul of the individual believer. It was also the monastery. It was also the cathedral. It was also the church as a whole. It was also heaven. And it was ultimately the universe itself. But really, it was Christ. At any, at, at any of these readings, the movement from the allegorical through the tropological to the anagogical is, an, is the imperative, and it can begin. One can start from any of these readings of the temple and, pro, and progress towards Christ, toward the ultimate reality. And through any of these sequences, the dynamic is one of the objective uniting with the sub subjective through the ascent toward communion. 
So this, I think, is ultimately a liturgical reading. Body and soul, intellect and will, all directed toward unity in Christ, a unity that's found in the Mass, in contemplation, and ultimately in salvation itself. Seemingly everything was read through the, this paradigm. I'll give you some examples. Progress in the spiritual life was accomplished in three stages, the purgative, the illuminative, and the unitive, which track with the senses. The monks sought perfection through reading, then through to uh, meditation and prayer, and then through to contemplation, which also tracks, I mean, explicitly so. I mean, they said so. The schoolmen adapted this monastic movement and changed it to reading, disputation, preaching, and then finally contemplation. The active and the contemplative lives were often aligned with the, with the senses of scripture, moving from the historical into the contemplative. Um, politics went from the coercive law through the new law of love to charity and to peace. Um, history itself was, of course, organized according to the same scheme, from nature to the law to grace and on to the eschaton, to heaven. Of course, none of these... These are hard divisions, right? You could chart this out. You can go on forever. And none of these are hard divisions between the different stages. Just like how the senses of Scripture flowed into each other, anticipating the sense that came after them and fulfilling the sense that was prior, so the lines between each stage and these different sequences were fluid and they overlapped. So one of the most famous schemes, and I think I can... um, What time is it? I think we're okay. One of the most famous schemes was um, that I think points to what I'm talking about here was the scheme of history advanced by Joel Comafiori, which you might be familiar with but I can think I can draw a quick diagram hopefully, bear with me let me see if I can remember all the pieces wait a minute, yeah that's right Three ages of history. Time goes this way. You have the father. You have the son. You have the Holy Spirit. This is creation. This is Abraham. This is Christ, the incarnation. Then Joachim thought, and his followers thought, maybe the year 1260? Why not? (laughs) And then the end of time. Okay, so what you have, oh, this is Abraham. Okay, in the gar- creation. Um, nature. Right? Um, and that's uh, history. This is the law. So this is where the father and the son overlap. It's the law, which is allegory, right? When you think about what is allegory, the, the Christological reading of Scripture allegory. You have the Christ event, then you have Son and the Holy Spirit, where they over, then the age of the Father ends, Son, the Father, this is the church, which is the age of grace, which is tropology. And then finally, you have the age of the Holy Spirit, when the age of the church ends, and these are the perfect spiritual men will come to be, and this is anagogy. So, Joachim posits um, that there's the, his system ha- produces four time periods which corresponds to the, the periods of salvation history and the senses of scripture. Now um, he believed, he and his followers believed that this age of the Holy Spirit was right around the corner when there would be no law, no institutions, no longer any need for scripture, not even any sacraments. And why did he believe that? He believed it because he believed that the final age was nothing other than the age of pure anagogy, right? Heaven itself, pure contemplation and union with God himself. And this is where Joachim made a mistake. Um, He introduced a dialectic in which the one age ultimately replaces and supplants the previous age. And Joachim, and especially his followers, were ultimately condemned by the church for this mistake, among others, that because they failed to see how each stage was brought up and fulfilled in the stage that came afterwards. And he failed to appreciate that pure anagogy, the purely spiritual life, was out of reach within this creation and would have to wait into the new heavens and the new earth. 
Now, Joachim's error, we'll see when I talk about the, the doctrine of analogy, Joachim's doctrine of analogy is actually condemned at Lateran IV, um, and it's a, his, his doctrine, his Trinitarian doctrine, which you see here in his scheme of history, crosses over into his Trinitarian doctrine and then ultimately in the way he understands analogy. So this is all interconnected. But Joachim was very, very popular. Pope Innocent III himself had a very deep respect for his thought and makes reference to his writings all over the place. And so while it was mistaken, it shows something about the worldview of the period because uh, they did not see hard lines. What we're seeing is they don't see hard lines between heaven and earth. They understood temporal life on earth as being a part of an ascent towards perfection. And this is why Joachim's scheme was so popular, right? Why it had so much purchase. This sort of thinking was the temptation of the orthodox of the period. And that's an important thing, I think, to get at worldviews, is how are they tempted? What are their temptations, right? Because what is our temptation? Our temptation is to divorce the spiritual from the material, to move heaven so far away that it has nothing to do with the material world in which we live. Right? Their temptation is the opposite, to combine the spiritual and the material, to, to bind them up so closely together that they get confused, right? that they don't understand that there is this final eschaton event. So Joachim's scheme, though, was corrected, and it was, a, it, was a, uh, it was very common in the period to divide salvation history in a Trinitarian way and to align the ages with the senses of Scripture. The senses of Scripture and the dynamic of ascent that underwrote them was ultimately Trinitarian to the, to the worldview that, that I'm discussing. And the Trinity was, of course, the most fundamental mystery possible. Reality itself was properly read in this Trinitarian way. So, for example, when Pope Innocent III wanted to expound upon marriage, he wrote a treatise titled The Fourfold Species of Marriage. The first, the letter, is the marriage between a man and a woman. The second, the allegorical between Christ and, his, and the Holy Church. The third, the tropological between God, God and the just soul. The fourth, the anagogical between the word of God and human nature. So he, he wants us to discuss marriage, and this is the way you discuss marriage, right? Marriage means something in the world. It means something to innocent. And, that me and the marriages that, that Christians had with each other could be read within this entire process of salvation. They were the concrete, right, the living people and things that are the start of the ascent to God, ultimately deification. So the four senses of scripture were really the four stages, perhaps the four senses of reality. Pope Innocent III referred to them as the four theological understandings, not the four senses of scripture. What we are seeing then is a deep structure, a reoccurring pattern that is observed and lived everywhere. It's what we might call fractal. I don't know if, if you're familiar with fractal patterns, um, fractals are never-ending patterns that are infinitely complex that are, but are self-similar across different scales. So um, what this means is you can start looking at it anywhere at any level of zooming in or zooming out, and the pattern is similar, if not identical, to anywhere else at any other level of scale. Um, and, I, and I don't have, I, I could have shown you some really cool things if I had my slides, but I don't. And what I mean by that, and how it, uh, but I can draw a quick thing here to help you understand what I'm talking about, I think. Oh, this is going to be hard. Uh, the, the most, the most uh, used example of a fractal pattern is just a pyramid that is itself made up of pyramids um, that do need to do that? That each one of these is consequently is um, also made up of pyramids, right? So, were you to zoom this out, it would just be exactly the same as this one, and it just goes on forever, right? Also goes out in the other direction forever, right? Does that makes sense. So it's fractal. It's a self-repeating pattern that's the same at any scale. Zoom in or zoom out. Now, what's interesting about this is they can be profoundly beautiful things, and I wish I could show you my, thing, my, my pictures, but it, what's really interesting about them is they're organic. Um, and this is, you know, physicists and ge people who study geometry now are, 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 are beginning more and more to understand how profoundly fractal the created, uh, the organic world is in, the, in creation. So if you think about like trees with their branches and pine trees or, or uh, shells, ferns, you know, just about any, you, you pick these things up and you see that they're fractal. Even, even the geography of the land is a fractal type patterns. Um, 
So nature is fractal, basically. There's a bunch of examples to it. Now, the reason why this makes sense for us here is that if God is a Trinitarian communion of love, and all of creation is, in a sense, an image of God, that it makes sense that reality itself would have a Trinitarian pattern to it, that it would be fractal in that way, with the basic pattern, the basic repeated sequence being a sequence toward communion and love. And in this dynamic, the sequence is what we experience as a temporal sequence. Right? But of course, in the life of the Trinity, there's no temporality to it. But this is, I think, what the medievals are doing with the senses of Scripture and throughout their worldview. Uh, can, one can start at any point, and the pattern holds. Right? We can see, and we can see the implications of this very, very clearly in the doctrine of analogy that Lateran IV expounds. But for now, we can see clear evidence uh, that what I've described is, in fact, the cosmos that the medievals understood themselves inhabiting. Um, by looking at Gothic architecture. Um, my dad was an architect. He's always talking about architecture. So I have it on the brain. But Gothic architecture, again, if you, if you can pull up some examples in your own mind, I'm afraid I can't draw uh, a, a realistic-looking Gothic cathedral. But <coughs> excuse me, Gothic architecture is characterized by fractal design. Um, it's immensely complex through the repetition of really very similar elements. If you think about the way, the way the arches work, if you look at it sometime, you, just, you can tell. It's basically the same shapes being repeated over and over and over again. Right? That's the way the ceilings work. It's the way the little ornamentations on everything work. It's the way the arches work. It's basically a fractal construction. But the, but the, the thing that's really interesting about it is that or, or it's not only fractal, but it's a, fract it's a fractal pattern that mounts, right? that ascends to heaven. So it's actually a, a representation of precisely the thing that I've been talking about. But it's even, it's even more than just its fractal nature. It's also, um, if we compare it to, say, the Romanesque, which comes right before the Gothic, um, the Gothic being, of course, the, the architecture of the High Middle Ages, right? And the Romanesque being of the earlier Middle Ages. Um, it, tends to be, to, to, it tends to clearly divide the inside of the building from the outside of the building. The Romanesque tends to express the idea of the church as a place set apart, as a place that is separated from the world, right? That you might think of it as sort of a sacred oasis in the midst, midst of a profane desert. But the Gothic is very different. The Gothic blurs the lines between the outside and the inside, not only in its architectural style. If you think about the ornamentation on the Gothic, it's basically the same inside as it is outside, but also in the massive stained glass windows of the Gothic, um, of the Gothic design, where they're designed to flood the interior with natural light and to soften the division between the outside and the in. So the Gothic cathedral is a microcosm of this cosmos that I've been describing. And it was a microcosm of this cosmos, I think, at the end of the ascent. So it was a vision of perfection, of what the order and beauty of the world could be through the process of conversion. And it most certainly is not insignificant, it can't be, that the cathedral was a liturgical building. And what happened inside that perfect little cosmos was the perfect realization of the ascent to God in the Mass, in the liturgy. So this, I think, was their vision. This is their worldview. Um, the world was a work in progress, from the historical through the allegorical to the tropological and on to the anagogical. There is a prof and there's a profound optimism in this vision, because as we have seen, it was the anagogical that drove the dynamic, and the anagogical is hope. So could the perfection, this is the question I think they're asking, could the perfection of the microcosm of the cathedral and the mysteries that occurred within it be extended to encompass the whole of creation? Right? And the answer might be with men it's impossible, but with God, um, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. And I think the medievals would have thought that grace was something that should not be underestimated. So let's get back to that sermon that Pope Innocent taught, because we're in a position now to understand at the beginning of the council what he's really doing, I think. So Innocent is situating the council within this worldview. The temple, which was the church as an allegorical reading, needed reform as in the time of Josiah. The pattern was repeating. As in the time of Josiah, the covenant needed to be renewed and the Passover celebrated. This renewal of the covenant was nothing short of the whole sequence of salvation. 
innocent preach that through this Passover may there occur among the Christian people who see God through faith a true passing over from vices to virtues. This is, of course, is the moving from the allegorical to the tropological, from faith to charity. But he goes back to elaborate because this passing over is itself divided into the senses. There was the work that had to be done, the external rooting out of the enemies of Christianity, and this was the realm of violence and law. This was the historical, the physical passing over. This is the call to crusade. But of course, where does the crusade go? What is its end? To the temple, to Jerusalem, which Innocent told the assembled fathers, cried out to them, using text from the Lamentations of Jeremiah, saying, O oh, all you who pass along the way, listen, and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow. Then pass over to me, all you who love me, for you can free me from my great misery. For I, who used to be the mistress of the nations, have now been made a slave. I, who used to be crowded with people, now sit as if I were alone. The streets of Zion mourn, because there is no one who comes to the solemn feast. This was a physical passing over, the crusade, but it was, it was a passing over into the allegorical. Jerusalem was not just a city in Palestine, not an in, not in innocent vision. And it was for this cleansing of Jerusalem that the temporal sword of the Christian knights and the princes was to be wielded. And this is the topic of, of my third lecture, which will happen in two weeks. But this physical passing over was directly connected to the spiritual passing over. Indeed, Innocent asserted that it was because of the church's sins, where Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, was adored. Muhammad, the son of perdition, is now worshipped. That's what Innocent says. Jerusalem had been overtaken by idolatry like the temple in Josiah's day, and Christ was now exiled because of it. This is then the jumping off point for Innocent's transition to the spiritual Passover, to the reform of the universal church. Here he evokes Ezekiel 9. Again, Jerusalem, which to Innocent is the church, is at the center. Remember in Ezekiel, the prophet has been shown a vision of Jerusalem. It is overrun by idolatry. Israel was not keeping the covenant. And the Lord was filled with wrath. In Ezekiel 9, the Lord sends into Jerusalem a man dressed in linen with a writing case to mark the foreheads of all those who mourned over Jerusalem's idolatry. This man was followed by six men who the Lord instructed to kill all those who were not marked. This was the cleansing of the city. Innocent now explains that the man with the writing case is the preacher. And the preacher was a man of virtue. A man who we might say had made the tropological turn who had interiorized the historical and the allegorical. He was to bring as many inhabitants of the city with him. He was to convert them to virtue and mark them as one. Those not so marked were to be slain, only now with the spiritual sword, with interdict and excommunication. This was the work of the priests of the Lord, both the preaching and the discipline. This was the work of the spiritual power and wielding the spiritual sword. So this reform of the church is a topic of the second lecture that I'll talk next week. But we see here then that the temple, Jerusalem, was the historical reality described in the Old Testament. But it was at the same time the church of Pope Innocent's day. And at the same time the contemporary physical city of Palestine, the historical, the object of the crusade. And at the same time it was the hearts of the Christian people, the tropological, the object of moral reform. But this whole scheme was ultimately directed toward the anagogical salvation sacramentally present in the Eucharist. The Eucharist was the most important of the Passovers that Innocent wished to celebrate with the Council Fathers because the Eucharist was the Passover itself, which brings us into the heavenly Jerusalem, the final Jerusalem. So Innocent begins with the institution of the Eucharist by Christ, travels through the history and into the contemporary church, and then ultimately beyond it, um, to salvation, but he, where that salvation is found is in the Mass, which is where he began, right, the, with, the, with the, uh, the, 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 the Last Supper, with Christ's, that's what he's preaching on. Thus, and so we can see that the, 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 the diverse aspects of sacred knowledge are unified for innocent, and they each find their place within the central mystery, the central Christian mystery, which is the Paschal Sacrifice. And there's also an intense imperative, an eschatological imperative to all of this, Josiah had attempted to renew the Old Testament or the Old Covenant, but he failed. Israel was sent into exile. Ezekiel was witnessing the consequences for the city's failure to keep the covenant. And now Innocent saying that they're faced with the idolatry, with idolatry in Jerusalem, in Palestine, in the church, in their hearts. And Innocent was attempting to renew the new covenant, 
to move the church through the stages to the anagogical. There were serious consequences for failure. But unlike in the Old Testament, in the New Covenant, there was hope, always hope. The grace flowing from the Paschal sacrifice had changed everything. Christ was not only the end for innocent, he was the means. All came together in him. So what I was going to end was showing a map of the cosmos of the 13th century, um, uh, an illumination of the whole universe that was painted in the 13th century. And, and, and if I could just describe it briefly, it, it has the world with Jerusalem at its center. And all of the world is sort of array, arrayed around Jerusalem at its center. Um, and it's the center of the material universe. But it's also where Christ was, right, incarnated. So it's both, it's both the place of the temple in the Old Testament, the place of the cross in the New. Um, it's a sacramental place. It's a sacrament. And sort of outside of that, you have Christ who's, who's over the top. And he's being incensed by angels. It's obviously a reference to the liturgy and to the mass. And um, so this liturgical world that revolved around Jerusalem, the, world, the, the Jerusalem on earth, was a, was a part of this ascent to the heavenly Jerusalem where you would come to Christ itself, right? The sort of perfect liturgy. So this is what the Fourth Lateran Council is about. Um, it's not about a list of laws and doctrines that were defined. This is the world in which they lived. And so this is the world in which when I do go through a lot of those, those uh, actual enactments of the council, I'm going to situate them within this. So for the next two lectures, we'll show how it fits in. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.